Foliated metamorphic rocks are showing preferred alignment of crystals within the rock. And this is caused by two things. The first is differential stress, and the second is elongate mineral shapes. So differential stress means instead of being squeezed the same from every direction, the rock is squeezed more from one orientation than it is from the others. The crystal shape, we do have minerals like garnet that are like a sphere or a ball that if you were to put differential stress, it wouldn't matter. They would roll, they would move, they wouldn't really line up. Versus minerals like amphiboles that are elongate like your pencil or micas that are like sheets, if they're put under stress more from one direction, they're going to line up compared to our equin crystals. Here we have random crystal orientation. So we're looking at a rock that cooled from a melt, and because it was a melt, the crystals were able to float, move, line up any way they wanted, versus aligned crystals in a foliated metamorphic rock that you can see the stress has come in and they're lined up according to that stress field. When we talk about foliated metamorphic rocks, we first need to go back to the beginning. The rock started the metamorphic rock started as something else, and that is called the protolith. The protolith is the unaltered parent rock that exists prior to metamorphism. So it could be a sandstone, a shale, a granite, whatever rock it may be, it's what's going to be put under heat and pressure and changed into our metamorphic rock. The first foliated metamorphic rock that we have is slate. Uh, it forms at the lowest heat and pressures. And when we look at slate, we are going to see a couple of things. And what stands out the most is that slate contains, creatively enough, slaty cleavage, which is nearly perfect flat planes that the rock will break along. And these are typically not oriented the same as bedding planes in the protolith. So if we were to look at slate, we can see that the rock has these nearly perfect flat planes that it will break along naturally and if we were to hammer it from the side you can see saw marks here from where this one was cut it would continue to break along these planes they're so perfectly flat or nearly perfectly flat that up until 1945 slate was what was used in chalkboards and today it continues to still be used as the material underneath felt in a billiards table so when we look at a protolith here we have shale we can see bedding planes in the shale where the sediment was stacking up over time. Our instinct would tell us the cleavage planes, or the planes that the slate will cleave along, are the same as the bedding planes that we see in the shale. This, however, most all of the time is not the case. The planes that the slate cleaves along are perpendicular to the stress. So say stress was coming in from the left and right on our protolith, the bedding planes disappear and the planes that the slate cleaves along become vertical. The reason for this is we get pressure dissolution on the sides of the grains of the protolith. Those then recrystallize what has been dissolved vertically. What that does is it heals the horizontal weaknesses that we see in the shale and it creates an vertical orientation of weakness in this example that the slate will then cleave along as the metamorphic rock. The second foliated metamorphic rock that we have is phyllite. Phyllite it has a higher heat and pressure than slate, still in the low grade typically, and has new minerals in the metamorphic rock that were not present in the protolith. So when we look at phyllite, we're seeing what is often referred to as a metallic sheen from microcrystalline micas. So again, if your protolith is a shale, micas are not in that shale. However, in phyllite, we've gone through the process of neocrystallization, making brand new minerals, new chemistry, new internal crystal structure that were not present in the protolith. And here you can kind of see that metallic sheen. There's typically a little tiny bit of waviness or sort of wrinklage to the surface of phyllite, and sometimes people think it kind of looks like a gigantic fish scale, if you want to think of it as that, but the metallic sheen 
should give it away. It's nice and solid. It doesn't have anything flaking off of it. And the giveaway again is that sort of metallic sheen to the surface. The next foliated metamorphic rock that we have is schist. When we get to schist, we're looking at a medium grade metamorphic rock for in terms of its heat and pressure that it was put under. And schist has to be made of over 50% coarse mica crystals or platy shaped crystals. In schist, <clears throat> there has been shearing and shortening of the protolith, with, which makes the rock very wavy in appearance, and it often contains porphyroblasts. So when we look at a schist, here we can see the shininess of those coarse mica crystals. Sometimes we're able to flake a little bit off and it makes sort of like glitter rain down or sit on the table. Uh, so again, neocrystallization. This time the heat and pressure was great enough that the crystals grew large in size. Shortening and shearing of the protolith has led to this kind of wavy appearance, far more pronounced than what we saw in the phyllite. And then porphyroblasts, I'm going to point out a couple here, are minerals that grew larger than the others surrounding them. So here we have garnets that are porphyroblasts. We call garnets or refer to them as garbage minerals because they can fit so many different elements into their internal crystal structure. They're able to grow very large very quickly. It's something that we often see in schist. It doesn't have to be there, but it is very common that when you see schist, it will have porphyroblasts or larger crystals uh, contained within it. Our last of the foliated metamorphic rocks is gneiss. Here we're looking at the highest uh, foliated rock in terms of the heat and pressure that it was put under. Uh, and typically when we look at gneiss, we're seeing coarse-grained uh, felsic and mafic minerals within the rock. When we look at gneiss, something else that helps us distinguish it is metamorphic differentiation. Felsic and mafic minerals are segregated into separate bands within the rock. Now, truth be told, we do not know exactly what causes metamorphic differentiation, but we definitely can see it within the rock. So here we have nice. Students often refer to this as kind of tiger stripes, so hopefully that will help you remember it. A great thing to write down for it. Uh, it looks like tiger striping. You can see that felsic colored, the light colored minerals, are separate from the mafic minerals in the darker colors. The leading idea for why this happens is that the mafic minerals are more elongate in shape. And what happens is the mafic minerals will line up according to the differential stress that's put on the rock. And as the mafic minerals are lining up to that stress, they're pushing the felsic minerals that have a more equant or sphere-like shape. They're not spheres, but they're more sphere-like. Uh, out of the way as those mafic minerals line up. Now it's not a great definition or explanation because we really don't understand it as geologists in the end, but we can see nice, again, coarse grained crystals. You can see some of them kind of glittering on the surface back to you. Felsic and mafic minerals that have differentiated into different colored bands within the rock. The last rock that we're going to talk about in this video is kind of debatable. Is it even metamorphic versus is it igneous? And for that, we are looking at a rock called migmatite. Part of the rock shows foliation, while other parts of the rock have random orientation, like we would see in an igneous rock when we first started the video. So when we're looking at migmatite, what we're looking at is an increased amount of heat that has reached a level to cause part of the gneiss to melt, or partial melting, as we call it in geology. So, when we hold a migmatite, we can see part of the rock is still showing foliation. There is some alignment to the gray crystals within it, while other parts of the rock are showing completely random orientation, what we would expect in an igneous rock. Now, when we look at migmatite, what we often find are the mafic minerals are still holding foliation in parts of the rock, and the more felsic or felsic-like minerals have gone to random orientation. Think back to Bowen's reaction series, what minerals form 
or in this case melt at the lowest temperatures, the felsic minerals. So they're the most likely to melt at lower temperatures, while mafic minerals will remain solid and are more likely to retain the characteristics of foliation. So when we look at magmatite, again it's debatable, is this even metamorphic? Parts of it we can see signs of metamorphism, signs of foliation, while other parts have gone to an igneous orientation to their crystals with random uh, because they actually formed from a melt. These are the rocks and characteristics that you should know for metamorphic rocks in the lab.